thing to last, how particular you are about being perfect, et cetera, et cetera. I don't personally, but I've been doing this for entirely too long. I believe the flux actually also helps clean the metal. Yeah, it does. Any stuff that's on the metal that doesn't want to allow the solder to flow, the flux, when you heat it up, cleans off uh, the metal to allow you access to allow the solder to directly connect the metal. That's absolutely correct. Um, I don't have that in here, but that is true. Uh, it will, it, it, as again, it causes, it prevents oxidation, which is what's actually causing that stuff to stick in the first place, most likely. And when you're putting it on there, you're causing things to flow off easier. So, uh, the secret to a good solder joint, as a, a very nice professor once told me, um, one of the ones that actually taught me something, is to make a solid mechanical connection before you actually do any soldering. So what that means is that if you're going to solder two wires together, you twist them together first. The reason that helps is because then you have a solid, actual electrical connection before you start putting solder on there. It helps, trust me. Um, let's see. I uh, ran into a problem with making this blue box where the buttons I picked up were really cheap. And what I ended up having to do with them was take breaks in between soldering because I couldn't solder each leg. I had to solder one at a time and then go back. And what that was causing was causing plastic to melt. So if that happens, you should stop. You should take a break or move on to something else and then try it again after the plastic's hardened. It actually happens quite frequently, especially with the uh, soldering onto the board. Sometimes you get stuff that's stuck or you put something in the wrong place. You make mistakes, that's how it goes. Um, but you don't want to melt the plastic. And plant it, it smells funny. This is a simple circuit. This simple circuit makes an LED glow. Uh, it's a six volt source tied in with a resistor. The resistor takes most of the current and then the rest of the voltage, which is probably somewhere between one volt and I don't know, three volts, drops across that LED and causes it to glow. If I take that LED and turn it upside down, this circuit would no longer work. The reason that would happen is because an LED is a diode. It's a light emitting diode. So. Anyway, this is really simple. If you really want to know how to do it, I can show you. But it's really too simple for my taste. Does anybody know what that is? Coffee is it a resistor? No, it's not a resistor. You should know what it is. That's the first transistor. That is the first transistor. I mean, it deserves a press. I don't know. It's not hard to guess, but Al didn't get it. So <laughs> Al should know that. I wasn't paying attention. So anyway, I mean, if you'd said Monty Python, I would have given you something, I but honestly. So anyway, I put that in there because the slide was just too boring. So this is a 555 timer I see. I actually built this guy, and I'm going to show it to you. So a 555 timer chip is a simple chip you can pick up at Radio Shack or wherever you want to give your business to. If there's a local shop in your area, shop there. Believe me, they're better. Radio Shack's crappy. Um, these components are literally like 10 cent a piece if you order them from Jane Co, DigiKey, etc. But I didn't. I went and bought one because I needed it to show to you guys. So that's why I have it. Uh, a 555 is typically the clock circuit in most standard electronics projects that hobbyists create, and they're dirt cheap. They're beautiful chips because you can create the pulses you need for the circuit. This one, all it does is make an LED blink, which, you know, uh, pretty, but it's actually really cool because you can then take this knowledge and you can adjust the resistor values that are in that circuit or the capacitance value, and you can, it results in other basic like circuits, right? timer and clock circuits. So a lot of clocks are based off of the same basic technology. Oh yeah, that's actually very true. Uh, I think most of those are actually done in software now, but it used to be that they actually did use these chips. Yes. And the reason they use these chips is because they're military grade for dirt cheap. Uh, Specific, and what that military grade means with the chips is specific heat temperatures, so they can resist up to whatever degrees. So I'm not sure how to, I'm not sure what the temperatures are at all, but that's what they are. If you guys want to pass this around, you're more than welcome to. I don't think anybody's going to fry it unless they lick it. So you don't do that. Um, although, even then, I'm pretty sure it would still keep doing this because the 555 is a pretty resilient chip. 
Uh, if you want to steal the nine ball, you're more than welcome to. I think it's going to die at some point, so whatever. Uh, if somebody wants to grab it, pass it around, how about it? I've got another one that was done with what's called a 556, which is two 555s wired together on the same chip. And the reason you want to do that is because you might have two different clock circuits in the same basic setup. And I'll pass it around too. I've got it wired up differently, and it's wired up differently almost on accident, but not really. Uh, it was wired up differently so that I could create a pulse for it where it just stays on for a certain amount of time and then turns off. And that's handy because maybe you've got like a, a sensor you want to trip and then have your outdoor light turn on for X amount of time and then turn off, which is what this will do. You should have to hook it up correctly. But if they want to pass out around too, how about uh, As I said, these things are dirt cheap. You can make the entire circuit for probably, I don't know, 50 cents, two bucks. There we go. So, parts distributors, which is what I personally enjoy. Uh, locally, you have Radio Shack, as I said, and that's pretty much it. And I have to rant about Best Buy Circuit City because, <laughs> and I've been ranting the entire time, but Best Buy and Circuit City are electronic stores, yet you can't find a fucking soldering iron. I don't know why. I think that's retarded. Um, that ought to say something. Do what now? I hate Walmart, so that's my personal thing. If you don't, that's fine. Continue to shop there, but it's Walmart. I don't know why. You can't. I don't know what the hell is wrong with these people. And they call themselves audio class. <laughs> so anyway, that's that's my rant about um, those places. I just I have a problem with someone saying they're an electronic store and they don't really carry anything. So, except for big fucking TVs um, <laughs> that I can't afford because I'm a college student. I have to buy $160 textbooks. Uh, so anyway, here is a Ramsey Electronics catalog. I'll pass this around too. Ramsey has all sorts of cool kits. They're pretty cheap. They're a really good company. They got rated by the FBI back in, I don't know, a couple years back. I don't remember exactly when. But the FBI came in and stole all their stuff because they were selling FM transmitters that you could use as bugs inside people's offices, which was sort of funny. So they just came in and like took all their stuff and like gave them an order to show up in court, which was sort of crappy because they Ramsey would have stopped selling them if they'd said something or whatever. But now they do sell them again, and you can buy them. So I'll pass this around to you. And this man's doing a great job of passing stuff. Uh, all right, I have the big fucking book. The big fucking book is DigiKey's uh, catalog. I love DigiKey personally. I've never had a problem with them. I know people who do. They typically switch to Janko. Janko tends to be more friendly to hobbyists. I will say that. However, DigiKey does much better bulk orders, and if you end up needing to order something in bulk, I recommend ordering from them. They also do small stuff you don't have to order in bulk necessarily. However, keep in mind that since they tailor to somewhat larger distributors, you can end up having to buy 10 of something instead of two of something, which happened to me with this project here. However, it ended up being a capacitor that was like 0.04 cents each. So that ought to tell you something about the electronics part. So free stuff. And this is the part I really like and why my presentation was titled what it is. Uh, free stuff comes from corporations who love giving crap away to students and hobbyists. And even if you're not a student, sometimes you can say you are and still get free stuff from these companies. And the reason why is because they know you're a student, or at least they think you are, and they love giving you free stuff. If you have a .edu email address, either as an alumni or whatever, use it. I mean, all they're looking for is the .edu. They don't care what's before that. Uh, you should ask for stuff in small quantities. If you ask for large quantities of something and then I find out that I can't get free stuff anymore, I'm gonna come hunt you down. There are companies that have stopped giving away free stuff because people ask for shitloads of it. And you shouldn't do that, it's not nice. Ask only for what you need. However, you need to read manuals before you ask for what you need, as I've learned. So this right here is a big box from Freescale Electronics for Semiconductor. Freescale is a fantastic company that does all sorts of weird development for microprocessors and what have you. They make a development kit called Zigbee, or they, they make a wireless platform called Zigbee. Zigbee is a 2.4 gigahertz wireless platform. I think capture the flag is up now. Oh, anyway. Uh, 
So anyway, they make this kit. It's really nice. It's a $500 development kit. All I did was tell them, hey, I want one of these. They sent it to me for free because I'm a student and they're suckers. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, and so anyway, what I didn't realize is when I asked for this that I needed a programming cable called a BEM cable. So anybody knows how to make one of those or buy one from somewhere for cheap? I'd love one. I don't have a way to program the Dagline thing. It's great, they sent me like all sorts of software for it, everything I needed except the fucking cable. I asked them for the cable and they're like, well, we can't send you just the cable. I should have asked for the $600 kit, not the $500 one, lesson learned. So eventually I'll get a cable for it, who knows. So anyway, just go search online for samples, requests, and electronics, you can get all sorts of cool stuff. Um, parts ordering, as I said, look at the data sheets. If you don't know what a data sheet is, I have an example up here. Uh, this example is for the XR. Whoop. I'm curious what your thoughts are on scavenging part. Oh, absolutely. Sorry, I didn't mention that. That's actually a good point. So I worked at a rather large company um, that loves to throw away all sorts of crap. This is a memory card from an older machine. Looks like an ISA card, I guess. I don't know what it came out of. It had a bunch of 64K RAM chips that I have up here. If you guys want any, feel free to come and get some because. I don't care that much for them. I mean, I've got what I need. But it had a crap ton of chips on it, and what you can do is it also had IC sockets. And IC sockets are sort of, I don't know, they're not expensive, but they can be more expensive than chips. And you can desolder them from the board. And there's a, I don't know, 24 or so, 30 something on there. Really nice, good stuff. Uh, the speaker for my blue box came from a telephone that came out of the same bin. So scavenging is good because it's cheap and free. Uh, form factor is very important with the components. Uh, P-dip is uh, plastic, something or other. Uh, dual in line, uh, something. Anyway, uh, these are a bunch of acronyms. They're not that important to know. You can memorize them if you really want to go online and look. Uh, variously, pretty much what it means is the type of component you're going to get. There are surface mount components, and then there are the three pole mount components. If you're a hobbyist, you probably don't want to deal with surface mount, although a lot of people are starting to do that now. I personally don't care for them unless I have to deal with it, so I mean, use it at your own risk. Surface mount means that the leads coming off of these parts are really small and really hard to solder onto. Uh, if you're that good or if you have a machine capable of doing it for you, have it. Um, so anyway, ordering the wrong mounting type means that you're going to end up with stuff that's hard to use. You can also end up ordering surface mount resistors, as I found out accidentally from DigiKey. Uh, oops, but as I said, they're like 10 cents maybe at the most, so it's not too bad. Large quantities are better. Look for deals. Uh, Radio Shack's going out of business all the fucking time. If you find one that is going out of business, get their parts. Like, get as much as you can because they're going to be giving it away practically. I mean, pennies. Uh, here's Project Blue Box, and there are some blue boxes. And there's a blue box that's in a case. This one's not in a case. It's nice and pretty, but not in a case. So, uh, so anyway, what, you gotta, what I did for this to begin was I had to research it, and I needed to find some schematics. And the schematics for the blue box, I'm going to show you in a second, they came from I don't know, some god awful website. but. They were schematics nonetheless. There is no one who has original plans for how to build one of these things. So I don't really know how the first ones were built. If I had to guess, I'd say they were probably done with 555 timer ICs and some sort of weird setup. But I don't really know. Uh, vacuum tubes. Yeah, vacuum tubes. <laughs> or, uh, I was going to say Draper whistling, maybe. Um, but whatever. Anyway, so. Once you get the schematics, you got to figure out how to get the parts, and I'm going to explain my problem with getting the parts. Uh, somebody else recently, I want to say it was on cue, had s rather, he didn't have the difficulty I had in obtaining these parts. Oh, he, eBay. Yeah. I looked for them on eBay. They were $50. I haven't seen them since. Oh, really? Yeah. Cool. I mean, 15 bucks for, for three chips. Well, like there you go. So, um, it's, it's with the so album I just like, ordered. Do an eBay, <laughs> an eBay watch, and it'll show up. Wow. Well, so anyway, this is the schematic that I turned up on the, the internet, the artofhacking.com, though I'm pretty sure that's not where I got it from. This schematic's not entirely correct, and the reason it's not entirely correct, from my guess, is that they probably wanted to stay 
I don't know, straight edge and not go against the law because they don't want you making all the tones. Though the really truly important tones, they have known correctly. The other ones they don't. Go figure. Uh, the XR2207, which is the chip used in this thing, I have the data sheet for right here. The data sheet's, I don't know, 20 pages or so. And the problem is XR is a manufacturer and they're like a lot of other manufacturers and they don't like giving stuff away for free, which sort of sucks because I like getting stuff for free. Um, so they didn't provide free samples. And DigiKey and Jamco don't sell this chip, probably because people like me do this stuff with it. And then some guy on eBay wanted 50 bucks for it. He's probably the same guy that you paid 15, but I don't know, I didn't buy it because it's $50 for a fucking chip and they should only cost me two, three cents at the most. So what I did was go and look up the supply chain I have no idea why that's cut off, but it should say locate distributors. And what that means is I went through and instead of going through XR to buy the chip, I went to XR's website and I clicked on the distributors link because XR is a manufacturer and they don't distribute the products themselves. They sell them in bulk to companies who buy them. And lo and behold, there was a local company. So what do you do when you've got something like this and you want to build something that's not exactly, let's say, legit? It's a blue box. Companies probably either don't know what the term blue box means, and they don't really, if they do know what it means, they probably realize that's illegal and we shouldn't be contributing to that. So function generator sounded much cooler to me, and that's what I went with. And as I said, companies love giving this stuff away to students. If you are one, use your .edu email address and get some free shit. Give it to your friends, I don't know. So these are actual excerpts for emails. Pretty much the first one is me saying, hey, I want some chips, please give them to me. And this company was actually based out of Raleigh, so that was really handy for me. And they were like, oh, well, yeah, we'll give them to you. Heck, we'll even run them by your apartment. Not such a good idea. But yeah, as you can see, their, their response was literally, we'll come drop them off over there. And I'm like, no, 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 that's okay. I'm, I'm not gonna be home during that time. If you could just mail them. So they did mail them to me. I got them in the mail, first class. It was fantastic. They came right directly to my apartment. Um, but it didn't have everything I needed. I just had those two chips. Those were the hardest to find components for this particular circuit. Other circuits will differ greatly and they will not necessarily be as easy or as hard to find. So keep in mind what you're building. Uh, I ordered some more stuff from DigiKey and then I went down to Radio Shack and picked up some breadboard because I totally forgot to place the order with DigiKey to get some. So, oh well, that's okay. As I said, Radio Shack's got a business, and they put their tools on clearance too, which is really nice, because you can end up with these fancy wire strippers, which I think I have up here. And the, they're called auto wire strippers, and you literally just insert the wire and pull them together, and they strip the wire for you, so you don't have to use your teeth, which means your dentist will thank you, and you also don't have to use a knife or some other wacky object to try and strip these circuits. There's my rant about Best Buy and Circuit City. Uh, so, I had to prototype the circuit before I built it, and I prototyped it laying out on breadboard. Um, it worked pretty well. I just tested one of the chips. I didn't test both of them, but it worked. One of the chips worked, so I was content. So then I was like, well, I'm going to start putting it on the board. So I started putting it on the board, and when you're doing pre-layout on a, on a solderless breadboard, it allows you to determine the layout of the final design, which is really handy. And when you're getting there, you actually need to make sure, when you're actually putting it onto the board itself and soldering it on there, you need to make sure the connections are correct. When I started testing this and getting it calibrated, I actually had two wires that were not connected, um, which was a bit of a problem. <laughs> Luckily, Quiet Ride had some soldering gear with them where we were calibrating this, and it worked out greatly for me. Uh, once it's on there, it's pretty much final unless you want an ugly circuit. Uh, you can make them look really ugly. You can make it look like you stuck the breadboard in the oven and uh, baked it for a really long time. It'll come out nice and burnt and crispy if you leave the soldering iron on there too long. Don't do that. Uh, you need to make it look nice in my opinion. Uh, you don't have to, I suppose, if you're just going for straight up, I don't know, function out or yeah, just straight up functionality. You don't really need to put it in a nice box like this and make it look all pretty. These boxes can be had cheap, by the way. Don't give them to Radio Shack and buy them there. Um, there's other places to get them for cheap. eBay is probably a good place to start. 
Uh, plastic food containers will also work for these things, um, particularly like Tupperware containers or whatever you've got laying around your kitchen that you're not using because it's got like a weird ring of orange stuff from where you left spaghetti in it. Use it. Um, if it doesn't smell bad, you know, if it does, you might want to wash it first. Uh, invest in a drill or a Dremel, like that way you can drill the holes for the buttons and stuff. So that's why this thing looks so nice and why it sounds pretty good. It's Dremel that, everything there. Uh, there are all sorts of LED things that you can stick onto these two. Mine does not have an LED. I thought about putting on the, one on there for turning it on, but then I decided that nah, I don't want to deal with it. There's the final product outside of its casing. It's a little big. I meant to make it smaller. Honestly, I did, but it just didn't happen. So it ended up pretty big on the breadboard, which is why this box is so big. And some sources of information, because my ranting is probably not enough. Uh, buy a book from a used bookstore. I don't know, printed after 1990. You can probably get one as late as printed late as 1980, and it'll still contain all of the information you need to get you through probably the first year of being an electrical engineer in college. You don't have to pay the tuition. You don't have to pay all that great stuff. You can get through that first year just by buying that book for 10 bucks, if it even costs that much. You can take apart old radios, things like that. I know relatives love to throw crap at me all the time because they're like, oh, my nephew likes playing with electronic stuff. We'll give him all our crap that doesn't work. Um, so I end up with like Betamax machines and radios and just random old electronics that don't work. This probably happens to you guys too. If it does, take them, take them apart and learn how they work and look up the circuits. One of the things you can do with ICs is look up the parts numbers online just by typing them into Google or I think there's datasheetresource.com or something like that where you can go and look up your datasheet information for each of the ICs. and. Look on the internet and start reading and ask questions. Don't sit there quietly. Ask questions. Like, figure out how this stuff works. So, as I said, ask questions. Does anybody have any? Can you describe the operation or what uh, the second little thing you're passing around is with the green LED where it stays on for a period of time and then it goes off? That's a 555 timer, I see. Oh, it's a 556. Oh, 556, sorry. Well, it's a 555. Is that one shot? Yeah, okay. it's set up so that it runs for a specific amount of time and then turns off. It's pretty handy to do that actually from time to time. I've had a couple of circuits where you really don't want to leave it on necessarily. You want to turn it on and then have it turn off after a certain amount of time. You can certainly do that. Any other questions, especially from people who are new to this and might be paranoid, especially after me ranting? Anybody who's going to go home and try this now? I mean, try and build something? No. You guys suck. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Which question? No, no, yeah, it's time. I actually see implementations for this. Really? Yeah. Oh, what are you thinking of? A love doll. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> anyway, what are you thinking of? Uh, multi frequency uh, solenoid uh, um, plenishing tool. Yeah, hey, that's. Certainly a good example of how to do this. You can set up, I don't know, a couple of 555s, vibrate at different frequencies, and hook them into the same circuit and get some nice pulses coming out of it. I. It's my time. Okay. I was going to say it's my time. No, no, no. Oh. Hey, you're good. <laughs> so, anyway, any other questions? I mean. What, what's the point of tinning? Is it tinning? Tinning your tip? Oh, for a soldering iron. That was what I was advocating not doing. Uh, were you here for that? I don't think you actually used the word tin. You were talking about flux, and I don't. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Very new to, and I'm just. I'm uh, so tinning your tip is. <laughs> browsing. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I resisted like eight times, and you just kept saying it. Anyway, so. Uh, what that means is sticking solder onto the tip of the iron, and that used to be something you would have to do for older irons, and you don't need to do that anymore because the irons you buy from Radio Shack are very corrosive, and when you start sticking soldering on, solder actually onto the tip of them, they rot away into nothingness, which is very bad. And I wish I had my iron here that happened that happened to me recently. I kept like pushing down on it, and it just it, it started disintegrating away, like it was gone before I knew it. It was sort of strange. What is that? What is that little? That's flux. That is flux. That is flux. Uh, flux, as far as I know, is not the same thing as tinning, though you might have heard differently, but I don't know, different terminology for different people, I suppose. 
uh, flux is we were having a discussion about earlier. Uh, essentially, it prevents oxidation. It helps things flow smoother. It helps your joint look pretty, and by looking pretty, it looks all nice and shiny and silver, which is essentially non-oxidized. Buy the right flux. Yeah, absolutely. Don't buy the cheap stuff. If you can get solder with lead in it, do it. Don't inhale it, but you can. <laughs> and not in California. The compound Eve was referring to, it's not flux, it's actually a tinning compound. Oh, really? It's actually more aggressive uh, than regular flux. Really? And its only purpose is cleaning the tip. Really? So as soon as you apply it, you need to wipe it off. Oh, okay. Oh. I typically end up using, for cleaning the tips of mine, I'll just use like a wet paper towel and it works beautifully. Well, that's the bad news. It all depends on how badly it's corroded. Yeah, that's true too. There's actually a couple different types of flux. There's uh, one which is an acid flux, which is a much better cleaner, but it also will rip up circuit boards and uh, corrode your copper stuff as well. There's other lighter fluxes like rosin type that don't do that, but they're not as aggressive. So avoid the acid ones in electronics uh, work. So flux is not something I use. So. The rosin flux is like when you're sweating pipes. Once it starts, you'll see it like bubble and start to flow. At that point, you like touch the solder to it, like sucks it in. Um, whereas the more caustic stuff is more like what you want to do with like steel. If you're doing like a, a flux weld that way. Really? So that's the stuff you would want to use for like dealing with pipes in the kitchen or something? Oh, um, you want to use the rosin stuff for the stuff in the kitchen. Really? Because it'll actually hold up longer. Um, you just paint it on. Cool. Yeah, that's the stuff I'm familiar with, which I mean, typically it's got like a little wick and put it on everything. I don't know, I don't like the stuff personally, but some people swear by it. So that's part of the reason I recommend using lead solder, by the way, is that you don't have to use flux as much, in my opinion. So. The purpose of tinning the iron actually is to keep oxidizing the iron. And yeah, it, that's. And it does help. Even the iron as well. You put solder on the iron, <laughs> wipe it off, so it will have a big bubble on it, basically, just get it clean. Tips are cheap, 69 cents for a chip. You replace every. So they're cheap, but I don't know. Like I, I'd rather not. I'd rather not have to deal with it. I, I mean, I like to keep them as long as I can. So I don't know. Like I said, I mean, yeah, they are cheap. They're fairly cheap, depending on where you get them from and whether you buy them in bulk and what have you. You could probably claim your student and get them for free for all I know. I haven't tried, but I might. Um, I love free stuff. So anyway, I've got this blue box, and I'm willing to pass it around, but you guys got to be careful with it, because I had fun making it. I want to keep it, because it's cool. Um, it might run out of batteries. If it does, too bad. Uh, a 9-volt uh, battery. I have them with me, so it's OK. I'll uh, hand it to Mr. Stroger over here, since he wanted to play with it first. It's nice and labeled, so you guys can see what it does. It probably doesn't make the correct noise right now for some of them. <laughs> I just a stepper switch. As I said, it probably doesn't make the correct DTMFs because of the way it's set up. You mean, you so. mean MFs? Uh, That's not DTMF. Yeah. <laughs> There's a big difference. <laughs> <laughs> Your talk's later, isn't it? So anyway, um, Maybe. to stay out of the freak so world because the it's... MFs? Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, uh, like I said, have fun playing with it. it. It probably doesn't make the right noises. It's since been sort of uncalibrated. And it also has, what's calibrating it is potentiometers. And potentiometers are essentially variable resistors. And what you do is you turn them. They're little itty bitty things in there, but they can be pretty big. Over here on this control board for the mic, there's a whole ton of them, the little knobs on top. Those are potentiometers to control the resistance. Ow, don't turn out the battery. We all want to try. <laughs> He's calling yeah. China. Like Share. It was Vienna calling. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys want to see anything else up here, I have tons of this stuff. This right here came from an Outback. And Steakhouse? Yeah, they were really crappy and decided that they didn't want to serve us, so I decided I'd steal their thing. <laughs> and by steal, I mean accidentally walk away with. <laughs> I mean accidentally walk away with. See, I at least gave the pager back. <laughs> well, I took it apart. Um, I figured out how it worked. It's, it's actually a really interesting circuit. I don't have the battery pack with me. They gave me a nice couple of NICADs, so NICADs are rechargeable batteries. What did you do with oh. the vibrator in uh, it's still there. I haven't messed with it. So, so. how does it work? How does this work? I like this man. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs>
Uh, it works through a nice signal that gets sent out and absorbed by this coil wire here, which is an antenna. The signal gets interpreted by a chip that is actually programmed via serial cable, and it's done on the back, and I can't remember the name of this. I want to say it's JTAG, although somebody probably knows. It's a form of serial programming for devices. Cable yeah. modems use it, and there's a lot of cable yeah. modem hackers who are really familiar with the device. Um, JTAG, uh, you can load the chips. Yeah, which is actually, I think you can do it with this. I haven't had the time to experiment with it you yet. You can uh, go to the web, and you can find a parallel port for J JTAG converter. Mm -hmm. A lot of them for like the ARM mm -hmm. processor. Yeah, I think that's pretty much the same process, the BDM cable that I was talking about for these guys. I, that's what I think that is, but as I said, I haven't had time to play around with it, being a student and having to study from $160 textbooks. Uh, I'm really bitter about that, by the way. <laughs> so anyway, I'll pass this around too if you guys want to play with it. Feel free to take it from me and return it to the rightful owner. I don't know what they're going to do with it. <laughs> yeah. Not serve somebody else with yeah. it. If you think it's generous, you can have one of those parallel ports. Oh, really? Right here. Oh, sweet. The man. Well, we might be playing with this later on and sending off Outback system to figure out how. Sweet. This is indeed a JTAG cable. So. so, this is another reason not to have a Mac because they don't have parallel ports. But you can probably figure out something yeah. well, somehow. People are just going nuts for that thing. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a place, dude. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, does anybody else have any other questions? I mean, I'm willing to answer or whatever. Uh, yeah. Have you tried the blue box on any... Uh... No, I haven't tried it on anything. <laughs> I, I, I just built it because I thought it was cool. If you want to play with it, you're more than welcome to. Do you still unprogram EEPROMs with ultraviolet light? Uh, you can, but not typically anymore. Everything's now Flash, Nan Nan, or one more Flash, which is silly. And Intel's done this new PRAM thing, which is phase change RAM, which is fantastic, and it's supposed to be ten times better than SRAM and DRAM, which, by the way, are shitty technologies. If anybody had any hand in inventing those, you need to die. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, SRAM and DRAM are such crappy technologies power-wise. That's why your laptops die, as well as the hard drive, which is also shitty, too, because some idiot realized that magneto-optical media was cheaper than they let it all out. Anyway, me rant. <laughs> I'm an angry person. Uh, no, so other companies love to send me free shit too. If you guys want to use this, feel free. My name's on it, but I don't really care. It's $500 free as a production special from this company that makes custom printed circuit boards, which you can do yourself now, but if you want to have it done, you've got $500 free. There's two of them. Feel free to pass them around. <laughs> oh, sorry. I was thinking about myself again. Uh, so thank you for allowing me to rant. I'm going to finish up a little early. If you guys have questions, I'll still answer them, though. I hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. I got to rant in front of a crowd. That's great. Uh, in the future, I would like to investigate FPGA technology, which is field programmable gate arrays. Uh, there are a couple of companies called Xilinx and Altera that make these nice devices, which are essentially microprocessors that you can reprogram. So you can have a PowerPC chip or an x86 chip in your PC at any given point and do all sorts of cool stuff with it. Um, you can also do other stuff with it, which is what I'm interested in. They're ridiculously fast at processing small algorithms, so I mean, they knock the pants out of like a quad processor system, the latest like 18 core monsters. Um, I need money for this if you guys want to donate. <laughs> I need resources as well, so if everybody's got something they want to give me, like a radio that doesn't work, I'll probably take that. Uh, if you can help, you know. If you can't, that's okay. I'm not going to hold you for it. Unless you're a teacher that makes me spend $160 on a textbook. If you need money, uh, well, you can help me get money, and then we can figure out how to make money from that. I don't know how this is going to make money, but I'm sure it's going to somehow. Uh, they're really cool things. I'd like to play with them. I actually sent an email to a company recently that was like, hey, send us an email if you're a student. We'll give you some more information. I sent them an email. And they responded with, well, we don't give them away, but we'll give you a discount. Well, how much is the discount? Well, the discount saves you a lot of money, but it's still $1,500. I'm like, what? That's not a discount. But apparently it is. Uh, they're expensive. You can get them for cheap, though, so eventually I'll probably have one. Any questions? Anybody? Bueller? <laughs> All right, well, I'll hand the mic back to Al. And let
Come on, one more time. Second year talk. This, this is really tough. I mean, I'm a douche. I've been doing this for a million years, and I still haven't done a talk yet. So, All right, so a couple announcements. We've got a schedule change. Uh, instead of the evolution of...